when an airport or an airfield is in operation it's quite easy to piece together the radio systems and to monitor them. It's harder though when the airfield has long since been closed and 75% redeveloped. In this episode I'm aiming to piece together the various radio systems that were used in the former British Aerospace and BAE Systems Aircraft Factory and Airfield at Woodford in Cheshire. This site has a really interesting history and was key in the design, development, construction and modification of aircraft for almost 90 years. So firstly we'll look at the airband side of things. The main control tower sat on the northern side of the airfield near Avro House. At one time it had an aerodrome surveillance radar called the Cossor 787 but in its later years there was a more modern Marconi 511 radar on the top of the tower. The control tower had remote airband transmitters on the old dynamics building around 500 yards west of the tower itself. Next to the control tower was a lattice mast which supported numerous receive antennas. And there were many frequencies used over the years at Woodford for air traffic control as you can see here. During the early 1980s things were slightly different. Tower was on 122.5 and 242.0. Approach was 130.050 and 247.9 and radar when giving torque downs was on 130.750. 122.5 used to be called Contractors Common in the 1950s and it was a frequency shared by most aircraft manufacturers airfields in the UK. In the 1980s, Clambedra Airfield in Wales caused some interference to Woodford on this frequency so the tower was moved to 126.925 where it stayed. The UHF air frequencies were used for a while as well, but a NATO frequency reorganisation changed them a couple of times over the years. The old radar was replaced with a Marconi 511 radar, a long range version of the Marconi S500 series of radars, and used a high power coaxial S band magnetron. It sat on a modular tower with an enclosed upper section housing, and the antenna consisted of a 5 metre aperture a carbon fibre reflector and a double horn system for dual beam operation. The radar transmitter was in a room at the back of the tower and it was fully shielded with fine copper mesh to protect other equipment and staff. BAE were reluctant to spend but one winter's night the ILS was unserviceable and the old radar had died. An approaching Nimrod test flight had to divert to another airport and this cost a lot of money. So with a budget of just £300,000 a team was flown to Southend Airport who managed to get the most basic model within budget. Today there's no trace of the control tower, it was completely demolished along with the radar, radio tower and all antenna equipment on December the 12th 2015. The UHF airband equipment was at one point made by Cossor and VHF equipment made by Pi. It was eventually replaced with Park Air radios and there was also an AOR scanner installed in the tower's desks to monitor Manchester air traffic. There was also a HF antenna behind the tower in the early days which was used when test pilots wanted to send messages from overseas trials. A commercial inverted V antenna was professionally installed and there was a Rockwell Collins HF transmitter and a Collins ATU in the tower storeroom. The tower was really lightly staffed and the idea that somebody would have to wait until late at night to get a message from somewhere across the globe didn't go down too well so it wasn't commonly used. To the south of the airfield just over half a mile away were the flight sheds. Mounted on here are four airband antennas which are still standing today. Two are on the top of a lattice tower built into the flight shed itself and two others sit on mounts attached to the building lower down. 130.025 was the ops frequency and was used by the girls in the intersite shuttles. The frequency was also used by the test flight ops department at flight sheds which also handled passenger details and fuel loading as well. Interestingly enough the floodlights on the main apron could be switched on or off by sending DTMF tones from a handheld PMR set. The avionics department had a dozen or so civil and military frequencies as well for trials on new aircraft types over the years including a GB9 HB call sign, it's not clear what this actually was. These were private and experimental call signs, more commonly known as test and development calls. They were assigned to organisations who designed or repaired equipment and needed to test it on the air. These frequencies were used on projects such as the Nimrod AEW3. 
The fire service used low band VHF on 86.550 AM for many years until multiple 455 megahertz channels were allocated. One set was allocated to the fire service who had the call sign red. Another was a tower and ground link for vehicles to monitor when navigating the airfield. And there was two other frequencies assigned to engineering and security and security's call sign was known as Hawker. The 455 MHz frequencies were linked to a four-stack dipole array on a mast which was on the roof of the main security gatehouse at the entrance to the site. The security frequency was on 455.850 where it remained in use long after Woodford closed. The site was bought by the JCB company and the frequency continued to be used by their security for a time. However, the license belonged to BAE so they stopped using it shortly after. Another important radio system on the airfield was the NDB, or Non-Directional Beacon, a radio transmitter at a known location used as an aviation or marine navigational aid. The NDB, which used the call sign WFD, transmitted these letters repeatedly 24-7 on 380 kHz. The beacon's 10 meter vertical whip and transmitter housing was located in a wooden enclosure on the northwest edge of the site, near the old dynamics apron, after it moved there from its original site, which was on farmland about six miles out on the finals for runway 25. The outer marker was on 75 megahertz, and it was also on that site as well. The NDB was always switching itself off after a heavy downpour at the old site, which was reportedly something to do with the ground plane. Air traffic controllers used to get QSL cars from people who had heard the NDB as far out as Europe. And finally, a mention has to be made of Harry Arnfield, G3LX, who was the chief radio engineer at Woodford. During his time here, he worked on the Avro 707 and prototypes of the Vulcan bomber before joining the air traffic team. He'd been involved with radio from the D-Day beach landing, so his whole life had been immersed in high-intensity RF. He maintained the equipment in the tower at Woodford to a high standard, even when Avro was reluctant to spend money in that area. There was an old radar mounted on the control tower roof, and prior to getting an ILS in the 1970s, that radar was the only way of getting Vulcans, Victors and Nimrods back to Woodford in bad weather. Harry would sit in the transmitter room with the equipment racks open, with 650 kilowatts of RF passing close by while he swapped valves and performed other pieces of essential maintenance. Harry incidentally was the life president of Stockport Radio Club until he passed away at the age of 95 in 2014. And that's the story of Woodford Airfield's various radio systems from back in the beginning up until everything was closed down and removed almost without trace.